Hello and welcome. Hello, and welcome to Moving Policy to Action, Declaring Racism a Public Health Crisis. We're so glad you're joining us to continue this important conversation, focusing on how these policy declarations are spurring actions around the country to address one of the fundamental drivers of health inequity, structural racism. You're joining the Build Health Challenge, Change Lab Solutions, and our partners in the Collaborative for Anti-Racism and Equity, also known as CARE, today. We first convened with members of the Build Health Challenge third awardee cohort, which just ended. Build aims to ensure that everyone has the opportunity to be healthy and thrive. It does this as a national awards program by supporting cross-sector and community-driven collaboratives across the US, working on everything from food insecurity and transportation access to maternal and child health and healthy housing. To date, BUILD has supported 55 communities across the country, thanks to the leadership and support from more than two dozen funding partners. Our local cross-sector partnerships found this conversation really useful, so we wanted to not only continue it, but open, but open it up to more leaders like you. So whether your community has already declared racism a public health crisis and is considering what the next steps are, or perhaps you're interested in learning more about what this means, we hope you'll leave today's session with the answers that you're looking for. Before we move forward, I'd like to invite anyone who wants to use the closed caption function to look at the bottom of their screen and click on the closed caption button, which will start captions running in English at the bottom of their screen. Also, a reminder that we will have a recording of this webinar, along with a summary blog post available in about a week on the BUILD website. We will also send a link for the video recording to all registrants. A Spanish language translation of the discussion will also be will also be made available on the Build website. We are honored to be joined by such an impressive panel of experts today. Each of them individually could and have led many conversations about these issues. Having them here together is such an opportunity to speak broadly and deeply about this work, about how communities have been able to not only make the leap and declare racism a public health crisis, but also to put that policy statement into action. We're joined by myself, Cesar De La Vega, and Sarah Bartel at Change Lab Solutions. We were the technical assistant leads and facilitators for the first build version of this workshop. Professor Yerby and Crystal Lewis are here from the Institute for Healing Justice and Equity, who came out early and powerfully with a plan of action. Don Hunter joins us from the Network for Public Health Law, and Brianna Stone is here from APHA, both of whom have quantitative and qualitative research chops when it comes to how these declarations have rolled out across the US. And finally, we have Jamin Johnson and Andy Wessel from the Douglas County Health Department in Nebraska to share their experience during their community's process of adopting and implementing a declaration. Thank you all so much for participating. So here's our agenda. We're going to start with definitions and background about these declarations of racism as a public health crisis. Then how these declarations have spurred action to address structural racism and its effects on health. For parts four and five, we'll take some of the topics that came up in our workshop and pose them to our panel today. We'll encourage you to use the Q&A and chat functions to be sure we're discussing the most pressing issues and we'll be monitoring both actively even though you won't be able to see each other's chats. Um, I'll also note, again, we'll be sharing slides so there's no need to take panicked notes and the recording will be made available with English and Spanish subtitles. <clears throat> So real quick, because some of us are lawyers, I just want to note that we don't provide legal advice or enter attorney um, client relationships, nor are we lobbying today. Um, and I want to start out by introducing a bit of Change Lab. So our mission is to use the tools of law and policy to create healthier, more equitable communities for all. And our team of lawyers, public health professionals, and planners work with cross-sector partners like BUILD to dismantle the five fundamental drivers of health inequity found in our blueprint for change makers, including structural discrimination and structural racism. As we said earlier, Change Lab works as the technical assistance leads for the Build Health Challenge, made up of teams comprising health sector partners, community members, CBOs, and local government staff. 
These collaboratives are funded over the course of three years up to $300,000 with a match by a local hospital or health plan. The partnerships are then supported by a national team providing technical assistance, including all-in data for community health um, and alumni mentorship program, evaluation and communication support and peer networking. BUILD is made up of 55 communities across 24 states and Washington, D.C. The 18 uh, 3.0 teams were central to the material and the partners that we're including today, and we're thrilled to be continuing the conversation. <clears throat> Cesar. Thanks, Sarah. So let's start with some grounding definitions. Project Ready, an online curriculum partnership out of the University of North Carolina, defines race as being used to categorize people who share biological traits that a society thinks are important. We know that race is always contextual and comparisons will shift depending on the speaker, the group, and history has many examples of people with the power to control that context, also being the people who define race and what role it plays in how people live. We can always trace back to identify some authority to change an underlying structure and the, roles, and the role race plays in that context. So that's why we're talking about US policies on structural racism. It's a striking example of addressing the root cause of health inequity by using government power. So here's a chart representing types of racism. Those that are more perceptible up here above the water surface and structural racism down below the surface, which is still very much felt by those who experience it. The impacts of it are very real. Here is the more thorough definition of structural racism from the Aspen Institute. You can read this, and again, the slides will be shared, but one key takeaway is that structural racism is not something that people choose to practice. Instead, we can think of it as a feature of the social, economic, and political systems in which we all exist. Our BUILD teams brainstormed the impacts of structural racism in their communities. This is a hard and long list to read, ranging from limited access to basic needs to the physical structure of our neighborhoods, all the way to the economic disinvestment in and heightened policing of entire communities. Bear with me on this one. Here, I'm connecting these impacts to some policy drivers. I know you can't read them all right now, but the point is that there are policy levers that influence every single one of those impacts. These are policies just sitting there, influencing the way structural racism plays out for you and for your neighbors by what these policies do or don't do. Policy can enable and guide other activities. It can influence the distribution of resources, money, opportunity, and power. It can focus attention on structural problems, not individuals. It can express values against bias and unfairness and injustice. It can undo historical policy-driven harms. Policy can initiate widespread change and sustain that change over the long term, especially these declarations, which can provide the commitment and the framework for investing in further policy change, like a racial equity in all policies approach. So now we're gonna dive into these declarations. Professor Yearby and Crystal, could you introduce this trend and your important work and organization? Absolutely. Um, so hello everyone, uh, my name is Crystal Lewis um, and I work with the Institute for Healing Justice and Equity as a public health law and policy analyst. And I will turn it over to Professor Yearby. Hello, my name is Rakaya Yervi, and I am co-founder and former executive director of the Institute for Healing Justice and Equity, and now a faculty affiliate at the Institute. And I'm going to turn it back over to Crystal to go through our discussion and then come back at the end and discuss uh, the Institute for Healing Justice. Yeah, so we've all seen the headlines, um, or we've created them ourselves. Um, you know, acknowledging racism as a public health crisis. Um, and with the events of the past few years, um, throwing US structural inequities into striking relief, state and local governments have taken action to declare racism as a public health crisis. Um, and so part of what the, the Institute for Healing Justice and Equity has done is since 2018, which um, was a little bit before um, 
uh, a lot of these declarations were put out um, into the public, um, we started tracking these um, and we wanted to understand them a little bit more, um, uh, particularly from a structural systemic perspective. Um, one second here. Okay. Um, and so what we found, um, just we, we have a lot of information, um, as Caesar said, uh, at the beginning, we have a report that is out, um, which we can share, and we actually have uh, a second updated report coming out, um, hopefully this next week, um, which will share some of that. Um, but what we have found, just kind of basics, is the, the first um, locations to declare racism as public health crisis was Dane County, Wisconsin, Wisconsin um, in uh, 2014. Um, and then Milwaukee County, uh, Wisconsin followed them in 2018. Um, and so we started to see this pickup, um, unfortunately, right after the murder of George Floyd in Minneapolis. Um, and that was also when we were seeing protests across the country. Um, and now police brutality and systemic racism are phrases that are top of mind for, for those of us who might not have thought much about these issues before, uh, before that instance. Um, additionally, there are uh, organizations that have followed suit. Um, so we have, you know, state and local governments, but also organizations across the country um, that have also done these declarations. Um, so now there are over 300 responses um, to racism as a public health crisis, and that includes declarations, resolutions, proclamations, pledges and executive orders. And I will turn it over to Professor Yearby to talk a little bit more about the Institute in our first report. Yes, so the Institute was created um, by four scholars, Dr. Amber Johnson, Dr. Kira Banks, Dr. Keon Gilbert, and myself at St. Louis University to begin to conduct work that will focus on addressing inequities through healing, particularly um, instituting truth, reconciliation and healing processes, but also tracking the ways that laws have been used to perpetuate racism and other discrimination to cause harm. And so one of the things that we were able to do, as Crystal mentioned, was to create this report along with Data for Progress and the Justice Collaborative Institute. We have also been lucky enough to receive a number of Robert Wood Johnson foundation grants that are tracking some of these issues and communities using racial equity tools to address um, these problems. And so what I just want to highlight is that one of the ways that we see uh, governments, jurisdictions, localities being able to address this is by working with people across disciplines, working with the communities that they are in, particularly because, as I mentioned, uh, the four of the people who came together to create the Institute for from different disciplines. Amber Johnson is from communication, Kira Banks from psychology, Keon Gilbert from public health, and myself from law. And we really believe uh, that it is important not only to get different perspectives from those in the academic field, but to partner with the communities most impacted. And so a majority of our research includes community groups and is co-led by those who are most impacted. So we can uh, try to identify ways to uh, move beyond the racism and discrimination that have harmed everybody, but particularly disproportionately racial and ethnic minorities. So with that, I will stop and turn it back over to Crystal if she wants to add anything. Yeah, I think we'll just go on to the next slide, um, which considers, you know, <clears throat> what does it mean to declare racism as a public health crisis? Um, so first and foremost, it really means naming racism for what it is. Um, there is no one specific definition of racism. Um, Unfortunately, there are different ways that we tend to think of it, um, but the more we talk about it and the more we have discussions about it, the more we understand it um, and can contextualize it um, from a society perspective. Um, 
So naming it is really important. And then I will also add to that identifying racism as a system um, is also incredibly important as we move forward. Um, and then second, we can connect a systemic racism to visible effects in our communities. Um, so for example, the way that resources, power, and opportunity are unfairly distributed uh, based on factors that have nothing to do with our value or worth at all. Um, so some examples of that are redlining, segregation, and systemic and disinvestment. Um, and then also um, through declaring racism a public health crisis, we can highlight the data showing uh, the unfair effects um, and impacts uh, that racism has on our health and how we, how we live together generally. Um, so both with the direct health effects like stress, trauma, bias in healthcare, and um, if you haven't heard of them yet, um, the social determinants of health, uh, like housing, food systems, air and water quality, um, and also income inequality, um, all play a role in, you know, how we look at racism and, you know, racism as a public health crisis in our country. Um, so the last thing I'll say here is um, we've also been a part of a, a collaborative, a national collaborative group called uh, CARE, which is the Collaborative for Anti-Racism and Equity. Um, and it is a, a group of us that have um, been doing this work around tracking policies as for racism as a public health crisis. And I will turn it over to Dawn because she's gonna talk a little bit more about that. Thanks, Crystal. Um, yeah, I'm really excited to share about the collaborative because I think it's a great example of coming together to help to um, to uh, uh, influence the narrative, to help share information and resources and connect people because so many people are out there including everyone, the folks on this webinar today who are doing great work. Um, I'll show really quickly that we have several projects in the works this, this year, including um, adding some features to the CARE website. So we just updated it to add a featured resources section and you can suggest resources, laws or policies to highlight. Um, so please do if you have some ideas and important resources you think we should share. Um, we will be offering some workshops this year. We are also going to be establishing opportunities for technical assistance and are looking at how to set up a peer learning community. Um, what you see here are screenshots of some of our partner organizations and their top resources, um, all on the topic of racial equity um, and anti-racism action. And uh, these are this is just a sense of what you can find on our homepage. This includes a network for public health law where I work. Um, and we're really grateful and honored to partner with these um, organizations and to share their work with you as we dig into what these declarations are actually doing in the communities where they've been uh, adopted. So at the Network for Public Health Law, we have researched declarations like several of our partners here, and we have provided review and analysis in many forms. And here what you see is a highlight of the three top commonalities among the preambles for the declarations. So that is the early text in the policy that justifies why it's being um, introduced and adopted. And so this particular set of uh, this particular analysis was uh, when we were looking at how the declarations address aging across the lifespan, given that many of them were issued in response to not just racial and ethnic disparities and the murder of George Floyd, but also due to um, the large age disparities that we saw during COVID. So the three kind of main themes that we saw that were common were one, that racism affects lifelong health outcomes even before birth and across every stage of life that racism significantly reduces life expectancy and increases premature mortality. And several, uh, many declarations actually um, include statistics for their communities on these two particular indicators. And then finally, that unequal access to opportunity affects economic stability, home ownership, and intergenerational wealth accumulation. And that we know that these are all things that have lingering effects on health outcomes over time. Um, so you can see here how each of these makes the case for how racism affects health and public health at every stage of life, including the most fundamental, fundamental components of health and mortality. And importantly, it connects the social determinants and in, income inequity with an intergenerational lens. Um, it's really important to think about 
how we age and the places we age and the things that support our health and well-being across our entire lifespan and understanding that racism doesn't just affect um, us at one point in life, but um, across entire generations. So for these kind of really compelling initial claims about the breadth of racism's impact on health, these declarations um, are policies that have embedded action, right? And each in their own way. And so these are some of the things that we've seen that are recommended kind of next steps for, you know, what do you do and how do you operationalize? Um, so that includes things like establishing policies and procedures to support community leaders, seek community expertise and incorporate community priorities and planning and budget decisions, establishing an enterprise equity, enterprise wide equity framework. Um, and that's really just saying you are adopting an equity framework as a way that you do business in your organization. Um, building workforce capacity. This is important. We see this commonly recommended uh, that this is done through training and professional development and health and racial equity, anti-racism, trauma-informed care, culturally appropriate services, and more. Um, another common recommendation is to review, revise, and enact laws and policies that address specific health and racial equity issues. And data is big. Of course, we know how important data has been during the COVID pandemic. Um, so there are a lot of recommendations around directing agencies to collect, analyze, and publish racial equity data. Um, there is also a recommendation to establish or support existing commissions, offices, working groups, positions, or what we like to call infrastructure to actually do health and racial equity work, um, requiring impact assessments that address racial equity, and then designing specific interventions to address the social determinant of determinants of health, and especially considering um, economic determinants. So not to spoil what's coming, coming, but these policies are very clearly built for action. I'm sure you already have some ideas about how um, to implement some of the things that you've heard. And I think um, I'm turning back over to Sarah. Thanks. Thanks, Dawn. I, I want to flag something that might be relevant to some declarations of racism as a public health crisis. Um, Anti-woke laws, as they're commonly known, are cropping up around the country as well, as I'm sure many of you know all too intimately um, or might be dealing with. So we're not going to go into any detail today on this, but we want to name that to varying degrees, these laws might influence the implementation of these declarations, um, especially those that include components related to workforce development and education and outreach. Feel free to follow up offline if there are questions about these complex interactions. It's outside the scope of our work today. Um, now we're going to hand it over to Brianna for a quick spin through some specific examples of actions that communities have taken that we've seen flowing from these declarations. And we'll also hear from Andy and Jamin to talk about the implementation of the declaration out of Douglas County, Nebraska. So Brianna, I'll hand it to you. Thank you, Sarah. Um, so before I dive into the actions that have been happening in these communities since their declaration to advance racial equity, I wanted to just quickly highlight some of the resources that are related to the declarations themselves. Um, so over at APHA, we've been tracking these declarations since the summer of 2020, and we have since put out interactive maps of them. This is an example of one that you can see on this slide where it's a map of the declarations that have passed in the United States, and you can move around the map and click around and filter down to see if your if your community has passed a declaration, if you don't know. So that's a good resource to find out and you'll get the date, some like details and the date of the declaration and be able to access a link to it. And on the same page on our website, you can also read our detailed analysis that we released last October. And this is looking at the contents of the declarations to see which specific actions localities have committed to to taking to address racism. So this is a more in-depth analysis of what's in the declarations themselves. And we do recognize that these declarations can stimulate and accelerate the pace of innovation and policy changes to address systemic racism and other structures of inequity. And there's evidence that these statements lead to further action. So more recently, we've done an in-depth um, research to provide case studies of how these declarations are resulting in actions to address structural racism. So we're highlighting a specific set of communities around the country. Obviously, that number is growing. Um, and you can see in the next slide, 
Yeah, so this is just showing you a portion of that map. It's a storytelling map. It's an interactive map that details the communities and their work, moving you around the community itself as you scroll through the narrative of their work to advance racial equity leading up to and after the decoration. So this is a really great deep dive that's worth spending some time on, especially if you're tired of looking at PDFs and reading text. It's a nice visual. And you'll see here, this is a chart that Sarah has created from those case studies on that map, just showing some of the overarching categories for the types of actions that have been taken in these communities and which communities implemented them. And I'll note that these are just from the initial set of six case studies, the three cities and three counties, but examples of these types of actions and other actions are happening all over the country where there's declarations in place. Um, so there's three overarching buckets to know. And the first one that I'll cover is the creation of a body, essentially a body to hold the work or advise the local governing body that's implementing the work and to take responsibility for either implementing or tracking the implementation of policies or practices that further racial equity. And then you need an action plan or a strategic plan. And this is something that the community can then return to and assess how things are going in the community. So while these inform meaningful action steps for the entity or the body that's responsible for work, it also provides a mechanism for accountability. And then finally, there's this catch-all bucket that is some other specific actions that were highlighted in those six case studies. For example, Minneapolis established a truth and reconciliation process to promote racial healing and begin implementing specific solutions to the specific harms that created and perpetuate racial disparities. Um, another example of a specific action, Milwaukee County created um, the evaluation, the evaluating vulnerability and equity model that they used to evaluate and guide equitable COVID-19 vaccine allocation in 2021 in their county. So these are grounding actions that in some cases immediately started doing the difficult work of owning and addressing the role of structural racism in these communities. And I also wanted to just highlight this link that has some additional resources that APHA provides on these issues and then really quickly just highlight specifically that the Healing Through Policy Creating Pathways to Racial Justice Initiative provides a suite of policies and practices that are being implemented and have been implemented across the country to affect meaningful change. So we definitely encourage you to reach out through this webinar or through the CARE website, which has an amazing plethora of additional resources. Um, and with that, I'll hand it back to you, Don. Thanks. So um, what I'm going to share is this list of takeaways that we put together the network based on some of the research that we have done, and I think also reflects the work of um, that our partners have done as well. And so the first of those is to acknowledge history. I think this is consistent with what Dr. Kamara Jones has said as an important step in or principle in addressing racism is to uh, recognize and rectify historical injustices. And you do that first by saying that, um, that you did something wrong um, and that you have a role in, in helping to correct it. Uh, that's followed by making a public commitment. Um, and that's one of the things that these declarations accomplish is by saying we're very clearly committed to taking action. Um, importantly, you have to fund the work um, and you also have to staff the work. So um, it's important to make sure that you provide the resources to engage in health and, racial, health and racial equity work in your organizations. That also includes building workforce capacity. And what we mean by that is making sure the workforce understands um, how racism affects health over time. It has a clear understanding of the social determinants of health, but also that individual employees um, and teams understand their role in helping to achieve racial equity. Um, and that includes everyone, even your finance team, um, you know, your IT folks, everyone in your organization should understand how they can contribute to the mission. Um, you have to focus on internal improvements first before you can go out and try to ask communities to engage in the same kind of change. Um, and then partner to expand your reach and impact. One of the things we hear often is that health departments and other organizations might have their hands tied in terms of what they can do and what they can say. That may be true, but you have partners who may have uh, flexibilities that you don't have. That's why it's important to establish those relationships um, and, to, uh, and to work together um, to achieve a common, uh, commonly identified set of goals. Use racial equity tools. The uh, report from the Institute for Healing Justice and Equity and the one that's uh, about to be released 
excellent overview of tools that are available and how you can use them and examples of how they've been applied. Um, and also design specific interventions. Um, I mentioned that earlier about addressing the social determinants of health. And then importantly, from a QI perspective, um, is monitoring your progress. It's important to know what works and what doesn't, and then using that information to redesign if you need to and to change course if you need to, um, and to know whether or not you're having the intended impact. Now, I know this sounds like a lot, and it may be a daunting task, um, but there are lots of examples out there, and you're going to have one right now, um, to, and I'm going to welcome Andy Wessel to share his experience in Omaha, in Douglas County, Nebraska, in applying, adopting, and implementing a declaration of racism as a public health crisis. Thanks, Don. I'm also joined uh, by Jamin Johnson, who's my boss, who heads up uh, the Office of Health Equity. He's the Health Equity Advisor for the department, so he's going to keep me in line. Um, just to understand a little bit about Omaha um, and Douglas County, uh, Omaha itself is roughly half a million people. Douglas County makes that about 600,000. Uh, the thing to know is our demographics are pretty similar to the rest of the country when you look down racial ethnic breakdown. Um, so in some ways, some of the, the things that we're experiencing as a nation, we're still experiencing um, here in Omaha. The other thing to know is that we're kind of a, a purple dot. Uh, in a pretty deep red state. And that, of course, creates some interesting dynamics in terms of doing this work. Um, part of what I'll also point out is if you look at that date of uh, when we passed the, when our Board of Health passed that declaration, you'll see June 2020. Um, so again, George Floyd was killed on May 25th, uh, 2020. The, the Board of Health met, passed this declaration about three weeks later. Um, if you've worked in government, you know things like that don't happen at that speed unless you've been really setting things up prior. And that was really the case for us. So for all of the people that are in the place of like, we, we missed this window, we didn't pass it, all of that, great. Do all of your work on you know laying the groundwork, all of that for the next time a window opens to be able to do something and move something forward. And maybe it's this declaration, maybe it's fab and class work, whatever it is that you need to be working from to be able to move stuff forward great do that. Um, for us, uh, the the sort of through line, um, the setup for all of this really goes back um, to 20, uh, 2006 with the creation of what was initially our minority health team and then became our health equity team. That was Dr. Frank Peake, who was on the Board of Health, who pushed and pushed and pushed and made that happen. And then, you know, that team was in that place of like, what do we do? How does this work? How does this fit in with the department for a long time? Over the course of all that, we got our footing, figured out what we needed to be doing. And part of that was then undertaking a racial healing project that started in 2019. That was something that City Match, a national MCH group, put together that we were lucky enough to get to be a part of. And to the point of like learning the history of your community, all of those sort of things, that was a big piece of that. And it was a lot of uncomfortable conversations with our health equity team, with our leadership. Our board of health was also pushing on those conversations. And so they were working on the declaration. And so when George Floyd's murder did happen, we were ready to go with going ahead and saying, okay, now's the time when we have to do this. Um, and so we were able to pass that. The other thing that's key to note about this is that there were 22 action steps that were built into that declaration. And what is really nice about that um, is that we already had the body of work like defined of what we were gonna do. And because it's in the declaration, it, it, that's even more solid than if it's in the action plan on, these are the things that we have to do. Now, the challenge with 22 action steps is how do you break that down, make that manageable? That was part of the action planning process that we've done with our community. And so we have four strategic directions. One of those is we have to have people working day in, day out on this. That's the Office of Health Equity folks working with our health equity team with now a group that our Board of Health created, their health equity committee. Strategic direction two is, okay, great. We've got our, our folks that are working on this day in and day out. How do we make sure this does go across the department? That's a huge focus of, of what we do um, with our work right now, what Jamin works on every day, um, and what we're actually building into a CDC infrastructure grant that we're working on right now. Third piece is like, how are you working with community? How are you getting to a critical mass, building a coalition of people committed to that? And that's a lot of work with our health systems um, and other key partners that we're doing right now, including our Chamber of Commerce. That's an interesting thing that they're actually um, doing some leadership work in our place, which is not something a lot of other places have. So we're trying to take advantage of that as much as possible. Um, and then the last piece is uh, for our strategic direction is how are we building an equity lens into our, all of our data and policy work? 
Um, and again, that's some place where we have an opportunity to partner with our chamber on all of this. Um, it's very exciting uh, to, to be able to do that. The last thing I'll say is, again, if, if we can find a way to do this in Omaha, Nebraska, no excuses. If if public health is truly a, a crisis, then we need to treat it as such, and we need to be unapologetic about that. Um, and I'm going to let Jamin chime in with anything I missed that he wants to add. Yeah, I just I wanted to kind of echo a few of the things. So one of the things that stood out from uh, from the earlier conversation is the reality that we need to both fund and staff the work. Um, that was uh, identified as a priority here in Douglas County. The, the resolution uh, required that we dedicate uh, staff capacity to this work and that we dedicate resources, financial resources to this work. And, and that is really important. And then from the perspective of being able to tell a compelling story of the impact we're having, looking at the, the data and then using that as a, as a tool and a message board for moving forward, part of that workforce uh, development and, and thought uh, went into making sure that one of the positions created in the Office of Health Equity as a direct result of this resolution was a dedicated health equity epidemiologist so that we have internal capacity to identify and tell, uh, tell the appropriate narrative with the data that we receive and be able to use that as a resource to our community partners to be able to compel and, and tell their story as well. So those are a few of the pieces that I, I wanted to make sure were highlighted that really do connect to, to the story that we're hearing on how to and how to take this and, and move it to action. Thank you so much, Andy and Jamin. Um, you're getting some love in the chat from locals who are on. Welcome everybody <laughs> from Omaha or Douglas County. Welcome. Um, so before we launch into a discussion among our panelists, I want to take a moment to um, get meta here. I want to acknowledge like these are loaded conversations and how we frame things matters for how people feel about taking action. And so declaring a crisis isn't necessarily like a public health communications uh, number one best practice. It's deficit framing a bit. And so the concern is that it won't motivate action. It might make people um, feel hopeless or any other types of feelings that would actually not motivate action. But there is an, an important action that, that can't get around that framing. And that is acknowledging the role that institutions and government have played in perpetuating structural racism. So you know, we as public health um, offices and as government actors hold policies that can change structural racism. Um, and the implication there is that those policies are also keeping it in place, right? So it's a balance of acknowledging past harms and, and our roles in them and in taking action to remedy them. So that meta conversation about how we message this generated a lot of themes in our first workshop. So I wanted to take a moment to, um, to flag that. You can see some of them here. There was a, um, a range of conflicting uh, feelings, even within the same community, not to mention across communities that have completely different experiences. Um, speaking about these issues and, and in passing these declarations. So, uh, you know, differences in whether it was moving the conversation at all or whether it was just sort of performative, um, differences in uh, kind of how the role of backlash was either helpful in, in really pushing that conversation forward um, or was, was sort of more harmful than, um, than I think some staff felt might be worth it. Um, also, you know, whether you're taking these actions with a declaration in front or kind of paving the way, these were all uh, valid observations and experiences that came up in the room and inform how we talk about them as we get into our discussion section. Um, and with that, we're going to now um, pose some of the same prompts that we posed to our community workshop participants, to our panelists to get their, you know, their high level view, their cross community perspectives, their direct on the ground experience. Um, and keep this conversation rolling. So our first prompt is on community assets. So we asked the folks in the room, can you discuss what you have found to be the top one or two assets to a community or an entity when implementing a declaration? What, what commonalities are you seeing among successful communities for those of you who are looking um, at, the, at the national spectrum of results? Um, and I wanna go back to Andy and Jamin to start with you all. 
on um, on how you viewed the assets in your community and if you could lift up like one or two of those assets that really made it happen. So, so I'll start with echoing a little of what I said before of like, it comes down to the people like you have to have people to be the torch fairs to be the champion of, of this work we were fortunate enough to have dr frank peak he, he was a former black panther who then went into education and got interested in health um and so he pushed on the board of health and pushed dchd leadership and now commissioner chris rogers has taken over that role and pushing from the board of health perspective but we also had then staff shermana losser um, was a huge person in the staff that that pushed and pushed and dr frank peak and shavana are both no longer with us and they didn't get to see us be at this place and it kills me every time i think of that but because they were in that prophetic place for a long period of time of pushing and not necessarily seen a lot happen, but we would not be where we are right now without all of that push. So if you're one of those people that's in that prophetic role and you feel like you're just pushing, pushing, pushing all the time and getting nowhere, I hope that it's the whole thing of like someday somebody singing your praises, talking about how you cleared the path for the success that your community was able to have later on. So it, it's huge to have those people who have the guts and the determination and grit to keep pushing even when things are really hard. Yeah, and I, I would echo that. I think um, pushing without apology um, is a really important, a really important part. And then, you know, we have we have definitely benefited from strong political will. Um, and we can't uh, we can't underestimate the impact of of that level of support to to be able to talk about things that um, are not easy to talk about and to talk about them openly and honestly. Um, knowing that we have strong support um, from our policymakers and so i think that that is um that that is one of the one of the things that um, has allowed for uh, douglas county to realize um, some success in this work and i saw something come through about not having a single champion too much responsibility and, and there's a whole piece of again the double burden on on people of color of like both living with ra the impact of racism and then having to push and so some of this again is like getting the white folks in gear so that they can be part of that champion work as well um and and yes like part of part of what i'm so excited about is like it was lonely even with the health equity team uh so you have to find your kindred spirits both within your organization, but outside of it, um, just to keep you going um, and so that you can champion the work at the level that it needs to be done. Thanks, Andy and Jamin. Don, Brianna, Rakaya, Crystal, would you like to jump in on this? Um, I would just like to echo what has been said, but really community is key. And I think what was just highlighted is that it's not a single champion. This is about building community. And so we all have particular strengths. Sometimes we need to take time off. And so that's what we are doing is working with community and building a community that can champion this. Um, because as you mentioned, you lose people, but you want to keep moving forward. So. I also just wanted to jump in um, specific to the, the declarations, um, because I've spent a lot of time reading through the declarations, um, but I also echo what Rakaya and Andy have said. Um, so the greatest assets or the most common things that I have seen um, in these declarations um, really does kind of go back to naming the thing. Um, and I think this starts to answer maybe one of the Q&A questions as well, is that by naming racism, it acknowledges that racism exists. That is something that is a problem <laughs> and is something that we need to address as a community, um, whether it's local, uh, state, or federal, um, and, and honestly, at all of those different levels. Um, so I think that that is important and that has been a I guess a theme has been something that has been fairly consistent in each of these declarations. Um, and then the other part um, is, you know, really looking back to the social determinants of health and finding that data from your specific community um, and how racism is affecting your community's health outcomes. Um, and so some people might have that data, some people might not have that data. And so starting that process down that road of 
of understanding what those impacts are for your specific community. And then the community at large um, have been fairly consistent across the board from my perspective. Thanks, Crystal. Don, yeah. Yeah, um, I believe in the power of repetition when you're talking about a key point. So I'm also going to say, I think the idea of having a champion is really important. Um, and what I will add to that is the idea of a lead organization or network of partners. Um, one example of that is Hillsborough County, Florida. Um, they there is a, a nonprofit group that has um, that is a coalition of partners who are working together to um, to engage the county commission around how to implement the declaration that was issued, and it's just this really great example of a coordinated effort. Um, and I think this kind of really continued commitment to holding the commission accountable to taking action now that the declaration is out there. Um, and then the second thing I would add that I think is important in terms of what I've seen from my analysis is that where some of the greatest successes have occurred are in places where there is a lot of other racial justice work um, efforts and infrastructure also in place. So these are places where you may have already had an office of equity established, there may have already been a racial equity action plan, um, there might have been a director of health equity or something like already engaged. Um, and so a couple of examples there are Orange County, North Carolina, and Buncombe County, North Carolina, where you, um, you, you have Asheville, that is one of the large cities that has um, committed to looking at reparations. You got it. They had a data, data equity um, dashboard put in place. They had uh, racial equity teams adopting the GARE framework, the Government Alliance on Race and Equity framework in their health departments. And so not surprisingly, we've seen some we've seen progress in those two communities, right? In terms of um, how they where they're at and in, in implementing their plan and taking action. Yeah, and I I feel like what I was going to say is kind of the summary of what everybody's already said. But what I've been seeing for in terms of adopting a meaningful declaration, that means the meaningful collaboration and partnership with the community, but also the ability to leverage that data that Crystal was mentioning. So for both adoption of implementation, it's not just that the data is being collected, it's how it's getting collected, which data is getting collected, but also how it's being communicated and how it's being used to inform programming. So when talking about these communities where the environment is a little bit more resistant to work to address racism and advance racial equity, being able to leverage the data to identify, name the thing, and respond to the inequity and injustices is important, but also it's making that data accessible to communities so then that the communities can use it to keep their government accountable, but also complement their stories with those stats so that they can work with government entities that might be considered part of that movable middle that needs the numbers. So complementing, complementing the data and the stories. Um, yeah, so I, I've been seeing and hearing that the facilitators or the assets to both adoption and implementation of a declaration is using that data to engage and collaborate with the community and to advocate to the decision makers. Thanks so much, everyone. Those themes um, reflect the themes that came up in the room at the first workshop. You'll get the slides, so I won't read through this, but this trust and relationships, the core of the people, the stories that they tell, um, that connection to data, these themes are all recurring, not only in the the communities that we had on the ground in that first conversation, and um, but also in, in your work and your research. So I think that's a really valuable um, reminder and such a valuable conversation. <clears throat> Our next prompt builds on that a little bit more. Um, it has to do with community power, not so much empowerment as honoring the existing power in a community. And I say it builds on it because we've already started touching about that. Wh who's already doing the work? Um, to build that movement toward addressing racism and racism as a public health crisis. Um, and so I, I want to ask, you know, what are the processes, the frameworks, the tools, and, and the examples of them that have centered community power in the process of, of policymaking and implementation? So Rukaya, Crystal, I want to go back around the table and maybe start with, with you all on this one. Okay, <laughs> we're guy and I always have a back and forth. Um, so uh, I would say that, you know, community advocates and community members are shaping this process um, because they are informing uh, their local governments of what this process is and should look like. 
Um, and, and so that's just kind of my perspective. Uh, there are a lot of community organizations that have been doing this work for a really long time. Um, and so they are the ones that are, are really framing uh, the idea. Um, and I think that that is, is powerful because they've been doing the work for a long time. I'll pass it to Rakaya. I almost hate to jump in and say more, um, I, but I do want to say that, right, community are the experts in addressing these issues, um, and that is part of the whole goal of government is to support and promote the health and well-being of their communities, and so that's why they need to be shaping the process, and not only that, but being a a key guide in the implementation. Many of the times we think we passed a law and we're done and don't really understand that some of the problems really come up during the implementation process. The last thing I would add to that is just they should also be involved in the evaluation process, right? Um, we often think that we'll get experts who will have this great statistics or um expertise and evaluation and community should be a part of that as well. Brianna? Yes. Yeah, I wholeheartedly agree. It's working with the community on community defined problems using community driven solutions. Um, it's taking the action on, like I said, those community identified problem solutions by providing also the tools and the resources and the funding that's needed for those community driven led and um, solution driven and led solutions. Um, I think a, an example of this that's happening in some communities in the country is particip participatory budgeting. So it's when communities make have their residents make direct decisions about how the government money is spent in their community by having the residents identify and prioritize the public spending projects. Um, and that's done in Chicago, it's been done in Greensboro, North Carolina, it's happening in other cities in the country. Um, and it's with it not just being community empowerment and it being community power, it's ensuring that we're not just asking community leaders and community organizers to show up and provide feedback, it's giving them the space to show up with power to lead and direct the agenda and when possible leading on policy. And all of this done with the local government support, including um, financial support. Um, and I, I think a good example of this is Seattle King County has done this or is doing this with their pandemic and racism community advisory committee board. Um, so yeah, it's taking action in community identified problems and solutions. Thanks, Brianna. Don, would you like to add? Yeah, yeah I'll just add a couple of examples. Um, I agree with you know what's already been said. The first is to think about hosting community conversations. And to think about that as a model where your organization, especially if you're the health department, are not the, you're not the lead, right? And so you are just basically providing administrative support. You're letting community members drive the organization, the agenda, the conversation, and invite um, established town halls and, and invite um, policymakers to those events and let community leaders and experts um, run the events. Um, and then you're there just to help make it happen. So we've seen some examples of that um, uh, in response to these declarations. Another point I would make is if you're in a position to do so, I think it's, you know, you have a responsibility to make it easy for community members to engage, especially if you're in a health department. Um, we have so many touch points with people and the services that we provide. Um, let people know, how do you call your legislator, your city council member, your commissioner? How do you how do you text someone? What are meeting times for city council meetings or county commission meetings? You know, how do you get on an agenda to submit a public comment? What are some talking points? How do you know what to say? Um, and even if you're not in a position to do that in your organization, you have partners who are. And so it's also important that you play the role of connecting people to the information they need to be engaged. Um, and the last thing I will say is because I absolutely love talking about workforce equity, um, is to think about uh, two specific tool or a specific tool, which is how do you have equity in the workforce? And this is um, an important way to engage community input is to, is to Think about how community members can shape job descriptions, interview panels, um, and final decisions on candidates 
Um, there are two examples that I think are really good. The city of Madison and the city of Tacoma both have equitable hiring tools that you could look at that both get at you know, how to engage more um, community members and to consider community considerations as part of the hiring process. Thanks, Don. Andy and Jamin, we'll end with you all. Jamin, you wanna go first this time? Sure, thank you. <laughs> um, so I, first I, I agree with, with what has been stated. I think one of the areas where, you know, in local government, and I have recognized throughout my career that we have a responsibility to do better is in um, our, in our hiring practices. The reality is we, um, you know, we follow the model that has been laid out before us for years and years and years. And that model does not, always lend itself to an open door to the most qualified and, and best suited people for, for employment. And, and that is, uh, it is hard when we are not modeling the practices that we expect to see in the community. The other reality is at the local government level, a lot of times our main role and responsibility is just to be a good convener. We have the opportunity to open, open doors and bring people together and connect them. And sometimes that is where we need to, to stop. We need to let uh, we need to let the true leaders within our community drive the work, and we need to just create a space for that to happen, um, and be okay with the outcome. So I think those are a few of a few of the things. And then you know, public in public health, we all are well aware that we historically are are really good at coming to a table with a solution to a problem we've identified and. And we need to recognize that it's, it's not uh, it's not our place to do that. Our our job is simply to show up, create a space, and be willing to listen. So um, that is, you know, those are really the takeaways that I have learned in, throughout my uh, throughout my public health journey so far. And I'll just add that you know, a lot of this boils down to at a practical level, like. Who, who can hold you accountable? Who feels comfortable holding you accountable? Like, mm -hmm. do you have that kind of relationship with the community advocates and community members that they're going to pick up the, the, the phone or send the email and hold you accountable if you're not doing things that they would like to see? And I can tell you that that's a good bit of uh, Jamin and my time is just, you know, fielding those calls, having those conversations, and then figuring out how we move forward. Um, and I, I talk a lot of times about if it's truly a relationship of, of equals, then it, it should feel like a good marriage and that we won't always agree, but we're going to find a way to work things out and keep moving forward and figure out what our way is instead of just your way or my way. Thanks, everybody. I'm mindful of our time. Um, so I'll just flag that when you look through the slide deck, you'll see a summary of some, some of the themes that also showed up in the workshop. And I think you'll uh, agree are reflected in this conversation. Um, we just have a couple more minutes for the Q&A um, and I'd like to make the most of our time. Um, so one that I wanna highlight got a lot of bumps and I would encourage everyone to check out the Q&A feature. You can see the questions that have been answered. That's the amazing thing about having this expert panel. They are responding live. So. Um, the question came from um, someone about uh, how the panelists would suggest a health department work with local government leaders who are not only not supportive, but are openly hostile to these efforts um, and who ran on and were elected on um, plans to dismantle uh, these efforts. Um, if anybody wants to tackle that, I think it's something that got a lot of, a lot of bumps and is continuing to get a lot of bumps. So if, if I could just start, um, I will say that, you know, we, I recognize that you know, leading a conversation, uh, calling out racism um, in our current, in our current world can be, uh, can be a conversation stopper. And, and that doesn't mean that I'm not going to do it or, or openly acknowledge the impact and the reality that racism truly does exist. But I've also realized that when we talk about, um, and, 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 bring into the conversation the reality that disparities exist broadly and that they impact everyone at some level. Talking about the impact of you know, uh, economic disparity or um, geographic disparities that exist within our community, that is, has been a way that we can start a common conversation where we have some shared lived experience where we can all identify the impact of disparity on someone around us. 
and then lead then lead into the conversation saying now imagine that you're a person of color imagine how how adding that you know that additional layer um, impacts your ability to live uh, survive and thrive um, that is been one area where we have been able to sort of tailor the conversation and then we've been intentional about identifying key health indicators that are non-controversial um, we you know we I am an MCHer at heart. Uh, that's where I spent most of my time, and I'm okay using that perspective to talk about the life force um, perspective and talking about the impact of um, infant mortality as a great indicator for um, the, the emergence of disparities within the life course and talking about average life expectancy as another indicator. And we can talk about the beginning and end of life then as as those key health indicators, and then we can talk about the reality that um, that a baby is less likely to make it to their first birthday if they are black, or that you know a a black uh, black man is less likely to live a, a long productive uh, life, and so we can tie those those factors directly to these key health indicators that are not controversial. I don't think there are many people that would argue that we want to see babies make it to their first birthday and we want to see people have a long, productive and healthy life. So those are some of the ways that we have um, been able to intentionally uh, start the dialogue with people who are initially an immediate no to discussing these factors and re bring them to the point where they realize that the true reality is that racism does exist and it impacts people's ability to just live. Thanks so much, Jamin. I, I want to recognize we're at time. Um, so valuable to, to end on that note of real like on the ground experience making this happen. Congratulations on you all and your work. Thank you all uh, so, so very much. This is an incredible list of people. We are so, so grateful that you were able to, to come together on this and to provide so many resources. Again, we'll be sharing um, recordings. We'll have captioning in English and in Spanish. We'll share the resources that came up in the chat and the links. Um, we just had a ton of great engagement. Uh, finally, I'll, I'll just say thank you all for participating. Um, it was a really uh, active and great conversation. And you can track us all on these websites, follow up with us, see what we're doing, see where the tools are, join our lists, um, share your stories, uh, feed into the work that we're doing so that we can keep this network alive. Thank you all so much for your time. Bye.